I was recently at a campout filming the Crystal series of films. After filming one day, one of the channelers in the film said to me, Did you know that you were Merlin's page? I laughed, thinking it was some sort of joke. But she said, I'm serious. Then she began telling me things that made my jaw drop in astonishment. It turned out that she was there in Camelot as well, along with many of my friends. I asked her a lot of questions, and when I got home, I got the opportunity to speak to Merlin himself. He is someone I have communicated with many times, as he is a part of my film team. Not as Merlin, but as his current self, Saint Germain. He began telling me things about that lifetime, helping me to remember. The stories he was sharing with me were so fascinating that I told him I really wanted to make a film about Camelot. He got excited about this and agreed to help me remember more, showing me what took place in that time. So come, take a journey with me to learn the true story of the legend of Camelot and the Order of Merlin. Camelot existed from around 400 to 600 AD. It was a real place, despite the insistence of historians that it never actually existed at all. One of the first things I learned when starting this film was very little told in the legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table is true. Most of the story that makes up the legends come from the book Le Mort de Arthur, which was itself cobbled together 700 years after the events had taken place from fragments of histories while the author, Thomas Mallory, was in prison. Although it may be a good book, very little of it is accurate. However, there was a real king named Arthur, and the Knights of the Round Table were real. And there really was a wizard named Merlin. The Knights of the Round Table were a group of knights from all over Britain, gathered together to help King Arthur with his ultimate goal, which was to unify Great Britain and create a more peaceful and prosperous society. To make the island of Britain a place of honor and glory that would stand as a beacon for the future of life on Earth. They never fully succeeded in unifying all of Britain, but for a couple hundred years, they did manage to create a beautiful and just kingdom that did much good for its people and has inspired humanity ever since. For this goal, many starseeds and advanced souls incarnated in Britain in this time. For those of you who don't know what a starseed is, it's a soul from another planet, often a more advanced race, who incarnates here on Earth to help with the evolution of this planet. Starseeds have been here throughout our history. They are here today in record numbers. Many Atlanteans also incarnated in Great Britain at this time. Some of the Knights of the Round Table were Atlanteans. Others were starseeds. I've been told Camelot was 
the closest this civilization came to the great empire of Atlantis, which existed for about a million years before our current civilization was ever born. Camelot was located somewhere within the territory of Wales. Camelot was the nicest castle in all of Europe. Many centuries went into its construction. It was as magnificent as it has been described. It was a medieval society and the details about daily life in that time that we all know are true. Camelot was a place of knights and jousting, metal plate armor, swords and shields. History says the Saxons from Germany began to invade England around the 3rd or 4th century AD. They began building settlements on the south coast of Britain. This set the stage for the wars that were to come between the Saxons and Camelot. One of King Arthur's most important advisors was Merlin. Merlin was a powerful wizard and a very successful alchemist. Merlin regularly met with the Knights of the Round Table to discuss important matters relating to the kingdom. I received a vision through Merlin's eyes of one such meeting between them. The Saxons were gathering in the woods outside Camelot, and Merlin was able to use his gift of foresight to determine they were about 2,000 men strong. He said it was only a matter of time until they attacked Camelot. The knights were asked to vote on war. All chose to declare war on the Saxons. Then, the knights asked Merlin what he could do to help. Merlin told them that his plan was to start a wizard's guild, which was to be called the Order of Merlin. This was to be not only a guild, but a school for young wizards. He foresaw a long campaign and said he would gather together many powerful wizards from all over Britain to teach magic to many of the younger children, which would greatly help with the war effort in many different ways. He said the teachers in his school were going to be able to help on the battlefield right away. And the younger ones would help in future campaigns when they got older. My own experiences with Merlin began when I was a young child of about eight years old, living with my family in a small village. My father approached me one day, sat me down, and told me that the great wizard Merlin had requested I become his page and live with him. This was a common practice in that time throughout the medieval world. Young boys about my age would go to live with knights or noblemen and become their apprentices. I would be serving and assisting him and he would be teaching me wisdom and magical skills in exchange. I had heard of Merlin, but I had never met him. And the idea of going to live with a total stranger away from home scared me. My mother also did not want me to go. But my father said, soon I would have to choose to learn a profession, like all boys my age, and this seemed like a good one. After Merlin came to visit me himself and calmed my fears, I agreed to become his page. At the age of nine and a half years old, I went to live full time with Merlin. Merlin was 104 years old when I moved in with him. 
Although he was quite spry and lively, and moved around quite well for someone of that age. He lived in a pleasant stone house in the middle of the woods. I learned to cook and clean, and run messages to town, and started my service to him in that way. In exchange, he began to teach me to read and write, and taught me many other things, including astronomy and the use of magic. The larger part of the magical skills I learned from Merlin were in healing. My father had been killed in the war soon after I left home. I was still grieving when he asked me what kind of magic I most wanted to learn, and I told him I wanted to be a healer. Merlin was pleased and taught me to do a form of healing that was called dragon healing. Merlin had just developed this form of healing in that time with the help of dragons who were often around the house. The dragons were never visible, being higher dimensional dragons, but they were around a good deal of the time, assisting with his work. Dragon healing is the combination of dragon energies and the violet flame. Merlin was a master of the violet flame. Dragon healing still exists today. It is known today as the healing modality of Reiki. So Merlin and the dragons together were the ones who first invented Reiki. Several years after I first became his page and pupil, Merlin began to gather those who could teach wizardry from among those in the land who were the most magical in preparation for the beginning of wizard school. I was given the task to go into the nearby villages and look for students among the children in the area. I was also to be a student in the school, so I was looking for my fellow classmates. The first time I was sent out to find students, I was told not to return home until I had found at least three students. I asked how I would know which students were magical. Merlin told me to follow my heart and I would find the answer. After a long search, I approached a very young girl who was about eight years old, who I felt might have some magical abilities, and asked her if she wanted to go to wizard school. She stared at me strangely and asked why I was asking this question. She seemed very skeptical until I told her Merlin was one of the teachers. Then she got excited and agreed to become a student at the school. Then she spent the rest of the day helping me find other students for the school. The idea of a wizarding school might sound familiar. By a very interesting synchronicity, this very inquisitive and magical young girl, whom I first chose to join the school, would in a future lifetime write about her experiences as a student of wizardry. We are talking about none other than the author of the Harry Potter books, J.K. Rowling, whom I have been shown by Merlin in one of her past lives, was that very girl we have just spoken of. On the first day of school, when she met Merlin for the first time, 
He told me that he said to her, You're very magical. I believe you're going to be the top of the class. I'm told by Merlin that this young girl resembled the character of Hermione in many different ways. After she joined the school, Merlin worked with her closely. I'm told the character of Albus Dumbledore was based upon her impressions of working with him. Merlin says she blended the stories about wizard school with stories about her time living in Atlantis in ancient days. Stories of wizards battling each other with magical spells is not from Camelot, but from the ancient days of sorcerer battles between Mu and Atlantis. Who did she base Harry Potter on? In the opinion of myself and Merlin, she based Harry Potter on a young male student that joined the Order of Merlin a short time after classes began. This young man was a student with very great magical abilities, with whom she was to become good friends. Incredibly, this young boy, whom she might have based Harry Potter on, would in a future lifetime write another famous fantasy book about his experiences in Camelot and the Order of Merlin. That person was none other than J.R.R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings. I believe that Tolkien in that lifetime was the basis for Harry Potter. It is most definitely clear that the wizard Gandalf was based upon Merlin. I received a wonderful opportunity to speak to Tolkien about these experiences. He is not currently incarnated, but one's higher soul is able to have a conversation telepathically with a living person in the same way that certain psychics can speak to your dead grandmother. He said seeing Merlin standing there, dressed in white robes with long gray hair and a staff, had such a powerful impact on him that in his Tolkien lifetime, the character of Gandalf came immediately to life and he even smoked a pipe. He taught me to smoke a pipe as well. The castle of Minas Tirith was based upon Camelot. I've been told the castle that stood in that time was as glamorous as Minas Tirith was in the books. The character of Aragorn was based upon King Arthur. Guinevere was the model for Arwen Evenstar. Aragorn's wife. Tolkien was a Lemurian and his books were a combination of stories of his time in Camelot and his days in Lemuria. The Silmarillion was Tolkien's dream of his life in Lemuria. He says the events that took place in the Silmarillion are somewhat accurate to what actually happened back then. In his stories, he told me the elves were based upon the Lemurians. The coming of men, as Tolkien described it, was based upon the coming of the Atlanteans. He also said he exaggerated the abilities of the Lemurians when he wrote the elvish characters. The dark forces of Mordor who attacked Minas Tirith were the Saxons and other groups who were trying to destroy Camelot. When Gondal fell to his doom in Moria, that was inspired by Merlin's disappearance, which we will cover later. When Gondolf appeared again and became the White Rider, that was a symbol of Tolkien himself becoming a powerful, full-fledged wizard after attending wizard school. In one past life vision, I was shown that I was on the battlefield as a healer, working with 
the healing properties of the violet flame. When a knight in full armor who had been wounded was brought for me to heal. When we removed the helmet, it was discovered that it was a young woman who was a member of the Order of Merlin and a student at the wizard school who had been wounded. She had wanted to fight but was told she was not permitted because she was a woman. So she dressed up as a man and put on armor and went to war, defying those orders. She fought bravely on the battlefield and was gravely injured. I immediately set to work to heal her. Tolkien was there that day, fighting on the battlefield as a wizard. Afterwards, I was complaining to him about my friend who had risked her life to fight. He told me that he understood it and thought it was a beautiful thing for her to do. After the battle, she was taken to the Houses of Healing in Camelot and she fully recovered there. She was the model for the character of Eowyn. The young woman whom we are discussing was none other than Brigid, the legendary Druidia in one of her lifetimes. Once we had enough students enrolled for classes to begin, school started. Classes took place in late afternoons and evenings, and the first place we met was in old ruins a few miles from the villages where all the students lived. It was entirely free for students to attend. Students did not live there, but walked there before class and then walked home again. The type of magic which was being taught in wizard school is not exactly what you would find in Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. A very wide variety of different disciplines were taught. Here is a sample of two of the first lectures we received on the first day of school. The path to magic is through the light body. Everyone has a light body, so in order to learn magic, you have to access and activate our light body and make it more powerful. This is the first thing we will be learning how to do. Now we are going to learn some movements to help activate our light body. Being a wizard isn't an easy task. It will require a lot of focus and time and major activations of your light body. It is going to change you drastically. You will become very different from who you are today as you access many of your hidden gifts. Speaking of past lives, an interesting fact I learned while making this film is that every single person appearing in the film Crystal Channelings, which is on this channel, was a former teacher at the Order of Merlin while I was a student there. There are many different legends of how Merlin died or disappeared off the face of the earth. The one that has the most truth in it, according to what I have been shown, is the story of Merlin and the Crystal Cave. This is what really happened according to my past life regressions and what I've been told from Merlin himself. I was approached in town one day and told that Merlin had been kidnapped. After verifying this as truth, I went to the school to talk to the teachers and tell them the news. After a long discussion, they seemed to have an idea of who was behind it. 
I was sent by the teachers to visit a woman who lived in a house next to a nearby lake who would likely know what happened to Merlin. I rode out to see her immediately and found her outside her cottage. She stared at me a bit, not recognizing me, and then said, Who are you and why have you come here? I've come to look for Merlin. I'm his page. Merlin was taken by my sister. My sister has him captive. I'll tell you where to find him if you want to get him back. But my sister is a powerful sorceress and you are no match for her. I wouldn't recommend it. Why was he kidnapped? Merlin has been meddling with things that he should not be meddling with. Then you have also helped to capture him. No, I did not. It was my sister who did it, and I am not happy about it. I do not approve of her actions. Therefore, I'm going to tell you how to find her, in case you want to try to get him back. Who is your sister? You may call her the Lady of the Lake. Then she gave me directions, telling me her sister also lived by a lake and explained to me how to get there. I rode immediately to the castle of King Arthur and asked the guards to let me talk to the king, explaining who I was and what had happened. After hearing my story, King Arthur stood up with great determination and said he would deal with this himself. He thanked me graciously and then said he would send messengers to Merlin's house when he knew something more. Days later, messengers arrived from the king. They told me there had been a great battle and the Lady of the Lake had been defeated, but many had been killed in the attempt as she had great powers. I jumped on a horse and rode off with them. When I got to the lake, I learned to my dismay that Merlin was entombed, and it was impossible to free him with the tools we had available. Then I was brought before Merlin to receive his final messages for me. I found him in a small crystalline room that appeared to me in my vision like bulletproof glass made out of a crystal material. It looked very out of place in medieval Britain. Merlin told me the Lady of the Lake had surprised him and captured him when he was not paying attention. He blamed himself for not paying closer attention. Then he gave me final instructions and a pep talk. I was told the king would make sure Merlin's last days would be as comfortable as they could arrange. Then I returned back home without him. Merlin has recently told me a few further details. The Lady of the Lake was an extraterrestrial known as the Anunnaki. So was her sister. The prison they had put him in was made from advanced extraterrestrial technology. Only the Galactic Federation could have freed him from this prison, as it could not be broken with sword or axe. He could have gotten the Galactic Federation to free him. But he was old and ready to transition to another form. So he used this as an excuse to leave his body. We had a meeting at school a few days later, and I told them about what had happened to Merlin. Afterwards, there was a big discussion, and people checked in with their guides. Then some of the teachers began to make announcements. They were aware of the Anunnaki and others like them. They said the Order of Merlin would live on and the Wizarding School would continue. 
but from now on we would be operating in secret. The order was going underground. It was too dangerous in the open, and they didn't want to attract the attention of the Dark Ones. They said from now on we were not to talk about the order to any outside of it. And no young students were to be allowed to practice magic outside school. Magic was only to be practiced in school. Soon after Merlin's disappearance, a new teacher came to the school. He was tall with long black hair, rather unpredictable and erratic, and had a nasty temper. None of the students liked him much, and arguments with him in classes were quite common, as he liked to make a lot of rules for us to follow. This teacher was very likely the inspiration for the character of Snape, as he was very similar. Tolkien says he was the inspiration for Saruman. A couple years after this man joined the order as a teacher, I was called to a meeting of some of the other teachers. We met in front of a fire in the darkness, in a secret place, where I was told this teacher was suspected of talking to the Anunnaki. The other teachers didn't trust him. Some of the teachers wanted to kick him out of the school, but others wanted to find out who else he was talking to, so they let him stay on. They told me to keep an eye on him. Weeks later, we learned one of the head teachers had been kidnapped by the Saxons and had been locked up in a dungeon. Everyone immediately turned on this new teacher, suspecting he was involved. He was subdued, both with magical means and by force. Then one of the teachers looked into his mind with his magical abilities and saw this teacher was involved in this treachery and had been up to a lot of other things as well. He was pronounced a traitor, and then someone cut off his head with a large axe while he lay there unable to move. Then all the male students were sent outside to dig a grave for him. We buried him behind the school. There was a sorrowful meeting the next day. It was determined we would have to move the school, as we couldn't risk them finding out where we were located. We only hoped the teacher they had taken would tell them all his secrets, so they wouldn't torture him. The teacher that was kidnapped was tortured, and he never returned, but reportedly he never revealed the location of the school. The next day we began loading all our crystals and magical talismans onto carts, preparing to move everything to someone's house while we figured out a more secret place to put the school. We moved fast, expecting the Saxons to show up at any moment. Suddenly, we received a visit from one of the king's guards who announced that King Arthur was here and wished to speak to us. Arthur knew about the kidnapping and the treachery of our now headless former teacher. He invited us to move the school inside the castle walls of Camelot. Arthur said this school was Merlin's plan to help the war effort and make great changes in the world. Therefore, he wanted to help us. He said that he would prepare a space for us to hold classes, and we would be under the protection of the king 
from now on. We were overjoyed, and we all cheered as he departed. A week later, we carried all of our things through Camelot's streets. On the way, we received great interest from everybody who was watching us. They shouted things like, We hear you're starting a wizard school. My son would be a great wizard. Can anyone attend classes? I want to learn to be a wizard. Someone shouted, Three cheers for the wizards! And everyone cheered. We were shown a series of rooms made of stone that were large, comfortable, and quite romantic, complete with large fireplaces for heat. As we were setting up the space, we received a visitor. He was there to make sure we were comfortable and to explain to us the terms of holding classes in the castle. Teachers were to be paid for teaching from now on and would be permitted to attend all meals in the great dining hall. Also, all enrolled students were allowed to attend one meal there, which would be dinner, as classes were in the evening. Teachers would be required to take part in any future wars or battles in which they were called to participate, as we now worked for the king. This happened on many occasions. We were often called to war, and there were wizards doing spells on all the battlefields of Britain from that time forward. We had a very excited discussion after he left, wondering if we could hold classes for everyone who wanted to take them, not just those who were ready to join the order, but for all the beginners who wished to learn just a little magic. We started planning classes on wizardry for beginners. The Order of Merlin became a part of the mystery school that King Arthur was hosting in Camelot. We were now under the orders of the king and there were many new rules to follow. One year the rules started getting very overbearing and it got so bad that myself and some of the other students considered quitting. Things slowly began to improve and the school continued to grow larger every year. Eventually, all the first students of the school became teachers themselves. Eventually, members of the Order of Merlin were encouraged to leave Britain and spread their wisdom throughout Europe. Wizarding schools were started by the members of the Order in many different countries. And the wizards who came from its ranks maintained positions of influence among all the royalty of Europe. Most kings and queens kept a wizard or two among their closest advisors. The Order introduced magic to our modern world. The fantasies we have of wizards, magic, and castles are from the time after the Order of Merlin began to spread throughout Europe. Around the year 1100, the Dark Ones devised a very complex and devious plan to destroy the Order of Merlin. They wiped out all the schools at once in a massive, coordinated attack. Those few wizards who escaped went into hiding. The Order of Merlin was eventually erased from history as the order was wiped out before the writing of books was common. But the legend of the wizards is felt strongly in our consciousness still to this day. When Merlin passed on, he wanted to watch over the order for a long while. So he watched over the school from on high, 
sometimes communicating with the teachers telepathically. Later, he incarnated in a variety of well-known lifetimes. Here's a few important ones that came after Merlin. One of the most famous is Francis Bacon, the father of the scientific method, as well as Lord Chancellor of England. Francis Bacon was the author of all Shakespeare's plays. This has been a debate for years, but it has been confirmed to me by Merlin. Merlin was also incarnated as another famous author, Mark Twain. He blended in so well in that lifetime, nobody ever figured out who he was. One of Mark Twain's books is a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, which is a satire that takes place in Camelot. Some of his experiences as Merlin are written in that book. However, the book is not about Camelot. It is more of a statement about feudalism. Today he is primarily known by a third well-known lifetime, Saint Germain, the Wonder Man of Europe. It is under this name that most know of his existence today. He is set to replace Yeshua as the Chohan of the Age of Aquarius. Saint Germain is also well known for his work with the Violet Flame. This is the end of this brief glimpse into the Order of Merlin. Some of you might now be asking for proof about some of these wild claims I am making. Well, I cannot offer you proof. I can only tell you my story. These are the messages I have received. And the visions I have been shown of the lifetime I experienced in the age of Camelot. 